Hello and welcome to the studio. I'm Bridget Nzeku and this is Perfecting Digital Experiences for Enterprise and B2B Customers. We're going to go straight to our roundtable guests uh, and Amanda Hamilton, I'd like to come to you first. Can you define from your perspective what is the digital experience um, for enterprise and B2B customers? What does that mean to you? So our business is uh, one of the largest providers of community care within the UK. So B2B to us has a lot to do with integrating data and digital experiences between other healthcare providers and between local governments and between social care uh, and third sector uh, companies and or providers. So for us, it's a very unique space. There's no one cookie cutter approach, just doesn't quite work for us. It means that each local community may have its own requirement for what that digital experience needs to be, different data sets, different functions, different processes that need to sit behind that. So it is very bespoke and very niche for us in what we can deliver into that space. Equally, it's quite, um, it's quite, those sorts of technologies and processes are very nascent in the UK. So it's very much a growing area. So lots of innovation in there as well. Um, you would no doubt say that uh, if it's nascent in the UK, you're in the forerunners, certainly in your sector. There are what I would call hospital, so NHS large CCG or clinical commissioning group sort of uh, functions that have been there and players that are in that space. But I think in social care, absolutely, there are a handful of players that are innovating in that space. And we certainly see ourselves as one of them. Carl Hoods. Can we get your view, actually, from um, from BEIS's perspective? What what does it yeah, mean so, to you? So, as a, as a central government department, we I guess we've got two angles. There's the enterprise services we run, in turn, which help support the rest of the organisation in the activity they do, and then the uh, the business facing services which align to policy objectives. So, uh, you know, we have a range of digital experiences internally, which. Uh, which can be everything from the core services and systems that people use. Uh, and all of that, regardless whether it's enterprise or externally facing, is really founded on that user requirements, that user journey, that user experience um, and the real need. So we spend a lot of time understanding and qualifying what that real requirement and need is before we then go and start to look at solutions. So it, it's not always a case of saying, we've got technology X and then we're going to use that for absolutely everything. We kind of try to forget about the technology to some degree um, and then come on to exactly what is the user requirement. Mm -hmm. um, is that the same for you? I can see you nodding away there, Joanna. Um, tell us about your your sector, your industry. Um, yes. What does it mean for you? Um, yes, I was nodding away about the, you know, putting the customer at the heart of it and understanding the outcome of what that customer is trying to, to achieve. And I think certainly in our case, we have so many different shapes and types of customers. So we could have, um, you know, a massive retailer that we're working with about taking their business uh, global and online via e-commerce and thinking about the outcomes that that customer is, is needing to achieve. And that could be online and it could be in store as well. They might want digital experiences for customers physically in store, but digital as well. So it can mean that for us. If you look at our hotel business, the experience area of our business, where we've got um, hotels and event space, and those largely being booked for enterprises, using them for um, events, what do they need? You know, what outcome are they looking to achieve to organize their event and use the technology as well within our, without, within our event space? Um, and then we've got other flavors of enterprise customers. So in our hosting business, if a enterprise customer is going to um, purchase our VMware as a service platform, yes, yeah, VMware, but what are you looking to do with it? What outcome are you looking to achieve with that? So I was nodding furiously when Carl was speaking about, it's about the customer and the outcome they're looking to achieve. And then we, we design an appropriate solution for that. It also means to me as well, everything else that goes around that as far as customer experience, whether that's support, how they engage with our platform, how they use our platform to delight their customers, their sort of direct consumer customers, um, as well as professional services, managed services, the whole wrapper that goes around that and digitizing that experience for them, for them as well. Yeah, in, in previous organizations, there's been a nod to customer centricity uh, talking about customer needs, but it was often the organization's view about what a customer wanted 
rather than what we actively and purposely try and do is actually speak to those customers, speak to those end users. And I think sometimes it can feel organizations fall into that trap of thinking, oh, this is this is all about the user, but it's our view of the user, not the actual user's view. So um, over the years, we've definitely tried to kind of change that and make sure that we're, we're really qualifying what we're building, what we're delivering against a real user requirement and a real user need. I'm going to thank you, Carl. I'm going to come to Leon, actually, because as a, a company that is a consultant in this area, I'm sure this um, the points we've heard ring true. Is this what you're delivering to customers so that they can deliver for their customers? I think all of this really resonates with me. Um, you know, the I think we specifically talk about the B2B uh, space and the enterprise space, and I think um, there's kind of two areas here. One is connecting to the company's value proposition through an interface. The other one is, you know, connecting the processes of the company. And I think this area of software traditionally has been, you know, like Carl mentioned, has been a lot of times focused on other values rather than the customer. It was a lot about the technology, a lot about the process. And I think there is a growing understanding that you should treat um, enterprise and B2B customers in the same way as you treat consumer customers, even if uh, the cost of switching is a little bit higher and even if, you know, uh, a lot of times there's no technology in the space and you you know any software is better than other software mm. um, but i think this kind of focus on understanding the customer's jobs and solving for that is what makes uh, digital experiences in this space successful and what would you say the uh, the key building blocks are um, for excellent digital experiences i mean uh, and then we'll 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 open this up to to um to our other speakers what 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 are you telling um, those who consult uh, elsewhere that they really need? What are the fundamentals they really need? So I think again, the fundamental, most kind of baseline is understand what the customer needs, understand the customer jobs, and focus on that. With you know, kind of investing in aligning the processes and the the technology, and kind of like pay the price that you need to pay for that to really solve customer problems. This kind of fundamental pieces, you know, like the different channels that the customers want to be at and a lot a lot of times for a B2B and enterprise API and how do you integrate with the organization is a very important channel. The onboarding, the processes of kind of two organizations working with each other, there's a level of complexity that's a little bit different. Mm -hmm. um, so kind of those are kind of factors, the cloud and how your organization is thinking about data and how it's preparing its services um, kind of across technology is very important. So there's kind of these hygienic factors, but again, I would say the focus away from the process and from the technology and its implementation and, um, you know, uh, no cookie cutter, we just mm. heard. Yes. I think that's an incredibly important yes. way of looking at things. Yes. Amanda, I can see you smiling there um, as, um, as he quoted your no cookie cutter approach. Um, so a lot of alignment on this round table about, um, about what priority should be. Um, what, what, in your experience, have you found to be these really essential building blocks? Are there any others you would like to elaborate on? I, I think, you know, really big lesson learned on the cookie cutter because you, you can spend, and to Carl's point, you can spend a lot of time, you know, navel gazing inside of the business and really, you know, building out what you think is a fantastic platform and then you roll it out and actually you need 50 different versions of that platform to actually meet your customer's need and best plans are laid until they hit the enemy, right? And and that that's where that would certainly change. I think for me, the other thing that resonated really well for me in there is understand your complexity. Because it's great if you've got a fantastically smooth UX on the front end of your digital platform, if it doesn't address the complexity of your own processes and then your customers' processes on the other side of that, and you're still doing parts of that offline or parts of that are not digitized, then you're absolutely hitting massive roadblocks. So big, big fundamental building blocks for me are customization and understand your complexity. I think that's got to be key. And I think the third part in there for me is quantifying how you're going to manage the integrity of your data. There is absolutely nothing worse than what's on that digital platform being inaccurate or wrong or having problems that you haven't fixed. So mm -hmm. focusing on the back end engine of that as much as you do the front end is a really important piece. 
Yeah, definitely. I think uh, just customer, customer heart and everything and, and making sure every decision that you make about that website, that app, that experience leads back to a measurable impact on a customer's experience and satisfaction. Mm-hmm. Um, the cookie cutter one's interesting because I agree in that in one way that it shouldn't be, you know, no cookie cutter approach. But at the same way, some customers are trying to solve exactly the same problem as another customer and there's no need to reinvent the wheel there. I think it's a balance of going... That problem you've got there, that outcome you're looking to achieve, we've done that a thousand times over for customers, right? Have that. But these bits are really custom and really interesting. And these are the bits that are really going to help you get there. So I think there needs to be a balance of not reinventing uh, the wheel. I mean, I can remember the early days when I worked at BBC and, you know, video player was a thing being thought about and you know you can always find another team there that was building a video player and it's like i've got a video got a good video player let's just use that one rather than having lots of versions of it mm. so i like I think, to refer to that as the the box of legos joanna you know it's yeah, like having yeah. legos and it's being able to legoize it and just pull out the box that you need for that and flip it together absolutely and, yeah. absolutely yeah. And yeah, we've built nearly all of your house, actually, but these bespoke <laughs> bits you want um, yeah. will really focus on getting those right. So I think the other thing is that clear outcome for the customer, making sure the entire team, or usually it's a number of teams working on this experience, all being aligned on the outcome. It sounds like such a simple thing, but if that isn't there, uh, people need to all be signed up and understanding what the outcome mm. for the customer is to make sure they're all building uh, towards mm. that experience. And then still on the customer, just the profiling of the customer. And not all customers are the same. They'll have different requirements. So that profiling or that um, the vo- having a good voice of customer solution making sure we're getting that feedback loop from customers on the experience and and how they feel about it and understanding those different types of customers and then power uh, powering personalization with that information as well because that's usually a very nice part of the digital experience is that personalization element and recognizing that a lot of customers are the same but they're different and we want to personalize that experience for them as well. Leon, do you do you think um, clients that you work with think enough about these issues in the right way, um, or do you find you're trying to change their approach most of the time from being doing the navel gazing, um, the navel gazing approach, and then foisting a solution on on their on their market or their customers that isn't really fit for purpose? Is that most of your well, do you think do you think it's poorly understood? I actually think it's very well understood in theory. So um, what we a lot of times have to do is to bring the different parts of the business together to understand together what every is kind of like you know mm. five people holding the elephant. You know, one says it looks like a snake, the other one says this you know it's a stump, and kind of trying to understand mm. what they're trying to achieve together and get to that agreement, and kind of moving from theory to practice because um, I think what organizations sometimes struggle with and what they really need to realize is that when you say that you focus on the customer, you actually have to do that. Yes. You know, so, and sometimes that's a um, kind of opportunity price or a pain that an organization or a change kind of uh, um, a cost that the organization has to go through to really think about the customer. And I love, um, uh, you know, the, this kind of, it is about the entire stack. It's not just about the interface. It's about mm. thinking through the entire landscape of the organization. And some of that is technology enabled and some of that is, is process enabled to change, to align towards that goal or that KPI that mm. you know, is at the customer's, at the customer's benefit. So I think that's, that's um, yeah. I'm just, when you said earlier um, that you're from telling clients and your advice is you've got to pay the price to do this. Mm. You need to set aside budget and time and man, woman power to really get to grips with this yeah. stuff. Um, and that does mean, I think, as Amanda said, actually talk to the customer, actually find out what they Yeah, what they I think need. price it, it's is... It's time consuming, isn't it? Price can be paid not just in monetary terms. You know, mm. It's about um, really taking the organization on a journey of change 
It's really kind of, um, you know, fixing things that are potentially uncomfortable. It's facing mm. the truth that you have to change mm. to be able to do what you say you want to do. Mm. And I think in today's kind of reality, um, how fast organizations are moving, if you don't do that, you're going to be left behind. Mm. I think, you know, we, we always like to tell our customers that technology is not just an enabler. You know, every organization is going to become a technology organization, whether mm. they want it or not. And it's a fabric that connects everything. Yes. Um, so to be able to realize that, and, you know, a very famous example, the CEO of JP Morgan just announced $16 billion uh, 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 investing in improving JP Morgan, becoming a tech organization. That's going to take the bank into the red. Mm. which is a huge thing for a financial institution, you know, but mm. he's willing to pay the price. And again, this is not just a monetary term. It's, it's a metaphor mm. for what the organization yes. needs to do. Yes. Where, Carl, have you identified or experienced, it, experienced pitfalls um, in creating digital experiences? Can you give us some examples of, of challenge, <laughs> challenges or common pitfalls you think can, you know, could be, need to be avoided? Yeah, I think to, to some the great bits of them have been have been covered in the conversation, but you know there's the there's the user need, but that needs to sit alongside the user journey. To Amanda's point, there's there's a little point having a really nice front end, but actually if you're then having to move into uh, an offline process or or to to move somewhere else, that being quite clunky. You know, I had a recent example of an insurance claim I needed to make where I fill out an online form, I then get an email back which asked me for some more information largely of which I'd put in the form anyway. Mm -hmm. And then it was a response to that saying I needed to call a telephone number to then ring up and get some some further information from me, which all felt incredibly disjointed. Mm -hmm. So I think, you know, there is the need, the outcome you're trying to achieve, but that needs to sit alongside that end-to-end -end user journey and that overall process. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's a good way to infuriate a, an end user, isn't it? And that's obviously got to be um, <laughs> avoided at all costs because they'll just go somewhere else. You know, it, it's actually a, it's actually an important way to survive as a business, isn't it? To get it right for the customer. Joanna, any comment, any pitfalls you've encountered along the way um, or seen others do? I will ask everyone for some examples of um, very, you know, success as well. But in terms of pitfalls, Joanna, what would you point to? Definitely. I think, um, I think you just hit the nail on the head, actually, about the customer will just go somewhere else. I think that's the world we live in now, so that experience has to be good. I think the most common thing I see is getting that outcome clearly understood and properly probing a customer about that outcome as well. So you're saying to a customer, what, what is it you'd like to achieve? And then telling you something. Not at that point, then going, cool, running off and building something and then coming back and probing, asking the right questions. Where I've seen things go wrong before is going, okay, cool, go off and build it and bring it back and go, here you go, this is amazing. And then the customer says, brilliant, now what we'd like to do is, is this. And going, ah, actually, we need to re-architect this whole thing because what you've just described, we can't actually achieve with what's been, with what's been built here. So I think it's about understanding the entire outcome, using that architectural mindset to design a solution that, that will um, deliver that and then getting all of the teams involved in that on board with that outcome and then and then going ahead and building the right the right solution and experience. And there's an absolute art to that, isn't there, Joanna? I mean, you, you can have a good conversation with a client and you think you've kind of gotten right down to it and you don't quite have the the sort of skills to dig a bit deeper, to ask the right questions. You paint yourself in a corner by accident. So absolutely. Mm. And I would imagine that's another area that you, um, you're very active in at Elsewhere, which is helping them to understand how to probe what's, what's really required. Yeah, I think um, talking to customers is super important. Um, building an understanding of their needs. Um, oh, I think, again, within this context, um, there's two important other areas. One is understanding stakeholders or subject matter experts in mm. organizations. Mm. And also, I think we, we just mentioned it, the employees and the processes that they need to go through. And the insurance example is excellent because I just experienced exactly the same thing uh, with my insurer. Um, so, you know, being able to support employees and invest in that and create great tools for them to support 
customers, mm. I think is very important. So again, v looking at the entire problem end to end and bottom, kind of top to bottom, thinking about strategy, the design, the engineering piece, all in a holistic mm. way, mm. Um, centered around customer needs, KPIs, but this, the business gets back out mm. of the activity as well. You know, it all mm. has to fit together. Well, it, it sounds like insurance is a sector that Elsewhen could perhaps we, target. There's some problems there. If we hear what Carl we, and we do and, work in insurance, actually. Yeah. <laughs> who would you? Who would you? I'll ask you in a moment, um, Leon. But um, Carl, is there any example um, of a sector or a or a firm? Can we name check some um, some organisations or sectors that are getting it right? Actually, they have done what's really required. They do really get their customer. Um, they do really have that architecture mindset to really probe and then design something that absolutely fits what the customer needs. Who would you say is doing it well? So uh, I think the advances in open banking, for example, have you know have kind of done really well in terms of those those banking applications and services. They're they're great, and I think that kind of moved from front office to back office. You know, in the early days, it seemed to be, you know, take mortgages for an example, very nice front end uh, to apply for your mortgage, but back to early part of the conversation, handed off to an offline process, took weeks and months to get an answer back. Whereas now that's, that's they've just moved further to, together really. So that's, that's definitely great. Mm -hmm. And then for me being um, slightly addicted to purchasing uh, sneakers, trainers, uh, that sort of thing, Nike <laughs> and Adidas do a fantastic job in terms of engagement and sell, upsell, cross sell, all of that kind of stuff. And, oh, but also creating a community around it, which I think is also, you know, kind of incredibly important. And, you know, to the old adage of go where people are, don't create somewhere new for them to go. I think they've done really well at kind of engaging with that. So, um, so there's a couple of examples for me there that I think have done particularly well. Good examples for me are companies like Swatch and uh, Ray-Ban, so on the retail front, where they are leading on that customization, where, where you can actually go in and build your own set of eyeglasses, sunglasses, you can build your own watch that is completely unique to you, which I think is very much responsive to market and consumers, you know, sort of wanting a, a slightly more bespoke feel to the products they buy. And they've really filled that niche. And they're just two examples. There's loads of companies that Converse does it. There's lots of sneaker companies out there, Carl, that um, if you don't have some customized sneakers, I'll certainly give you a, a link to where I get mine. But, <laughs> uh, but, but yeah, I think there's some really great examples in the retail space where they're absolutely maximizing um, yeah. front end product and front end, front end uh, user engagement and product development off the back of that. So. I, I was going across that Ray-Ban, amazing. Absolutely love that, that ability, you know, to personalize things. That's a huge area at the moment. And Monzo, for me, I, I just think they've got it absolutely spot on with the experience. And they constantly continue to evolve mm. um, and make things mm. so easy, visible, lots of control and I definitely make decisions in my personal life based on how much control and simplification I can bring into my life and I move away from businesses that don't that don't give me that ability you know insurance is a terrible one utilities um you know a lot of utilities managing your gas and your water and with the increasing cost of living people want access to that information they want to do modeling and all of that really easily um so yeah, they're the ones I can. Oh, Uber, Uber's a good good example of mm -hmm. ease ease of uh, control and uh, simplification. Um, delivery, a lot of the sort of um, the food apps now are really good, not just for the direct consumer, but that B two B those that actually want to use the platform to to run their business as well. Leon, we've heard some some great examples of success there. Um, isn't part of the challenge that you know, the consumer can be tricky, you know, the customer can be tricky, they can, they can change or the zeitgeist suddenly shifts and a, an organisation has to catch up with that. Um, unless they employ some really good future gazers like, like the people at Hot Topics actually, who are looking at what's coming down the track. Um, how much of a challenge is that for your clients? Well, it's an interesting question because I'm, again, going to take it from kind of the enterprise and yes. B2B angle. And what you said about the consumer is so true. The switch cost for a consumer is very low. So historically, consumer companies had to just 
by the nature of the flickness of the customer to respond to that and be very focused on the customer. With B2B and enterprise, the switch cost is a little bit higher and the entry of technology is a little bit lower. So there is a little bit less of an incentive, but that really changes because of how you know, our expectation of software is changing because of what we see in, in the consumer space, we want that in our B2B and enterprise space. Mm. So, you know, being able to deliver that at that level is, I think, for organizations, very important. And a couple of companies that I find very inspiring are Square, which actually changed its name to Block. Right. So just at a level of innovation, you know, they do payments and they kind of, just the amount of uh, areas that they cover and how customer focused they are in B2B and enterprise. Monday.com, which really brings kind of, uh, you know, uh, consumer patterns into B2B software. I think it's very, uh, very important, very interesting, and this is where things are going. But just to save the insurance uh, industry <laughs> for a second, uh, I think there's a great company called Zigo. Um, they do uh, on-demand insurance for ride hailing and ride shares. And, you know, it's a, it's a UK unicorn insurance a unicorn and they really bring that customer centricity and responsiveness into 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 the sector mm. and i think you know the large uh, uh kind of um, uh, companies in this space should really watch how how it can how be doing. done how mm. it can be mm. uh, how, how value can be delivered mm. in terms of some of the examples that have been used they're all fairly new startup type organizations yes. so they've been born digitally i think mm. clearly there's that tension between century old organizations that have got ingrained ways of working and practices uh, that's incredibly difficult to shift away from huge legacy positions so i think there's there's definitely a lot that big organizations can learn from those that are born digitally if that's the right sort of phrase versus those that are trying to digitally transform uh, and that's an interesting area for us that we we continue to try and engage with those organizations and learn from them so that we can then start to apply that to our own enterprise services Oh, thanks, Carl. That that brings me to um, nicely to our last question, actually, because I think um, it's an interesting point you raise about this almost a different mindset, actually, um, than maybe what might be termed as a legacy um, organisation or a leg legacy mindset. It's a very much more uh, now mindset um, and very flexible and fleet of foot, you know, e able to react and be agile. Um, and I think that, you know, when when organizations are trying to or people within are trying to persuade their leaders to fund um, projects to make sure that the digital experience is going to be a good one, which is about the survival of the organization, survival of the business. What 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 can be done to to persuade leaders? Um, how can you prove the commercial value um, of providing these digital experiences that delight users if leaders aren't really on board. Can we start with you, Joanna? Yeah, sure. I think um, there's a comment a minute ago about cost to switch for enterprises being a, a lot higher than consumers, which is definitely true, and speed as well. But I think that's lessening um, over time. And I think I think the reason why a lot of these startup businesses um, are able to adopt a lot quicker is because they're building in a sort of cloud native type approach to things, which means they can run their stuff anywhere. If you can run your stuff on anything anywhere, you can switch quite quickly. So you need to have a fantastic customer experience, digital experience, because that's going to help them be a bit more sticky and want to, and want to stay with you. So I think there's value in that, in the sort of usage stats, the customer feedback, because I think we will get to a point with enterprise customers where they will be switching as quickly, maybe not as quickly and easily as consumers do, but definitely a lot more quickly than we've been used to, used to in the past. So because of that sort of permanent uh, switch to being able to do things online very quickly, we definitely need to make sure that we're caught up and we're providing that experience for our, for our enterprise customers um, as well. Um, because any serious flaws in that experience will lead to customers leaving you and going elsewhere to, to your competitors. So actually making leaders aware of that risk. Yeah, absolutely, because I think when I think about our organisation, we think about this from two ways. You know, we think about all the services we consume 
from other from other vendors and how we want to make ourselves um, very flexible and fast and agile and able to move our workloads around. Um, we know the things that we value as far as the, the digital and customer experience goes, and we want to build those same, same things for our customers as well. So we're sort of seeing it, seeing it from both sides. So making sure that you know the leadership really understand that and can see the impact of that and that you've got real experiences of the voice of the customer um telling you telling you that um you know the results will speak for themselves really mm. thanks joanna that was a, a, a really good summary um amanda can we get your thoughts you know how, how would you go about persuading leaders to see the value here you've talked about in the social care sector for example not, not quite as um you know, not quite as advanced, perhaps, as some of the other areas you work with? I, I think there's three key, in, in sector aside, right, I think there's three key areas for me in there. First of all, I talk about cash flow. I mean, we're talking about people that fund things and, and they want to manage purse strings. And I talk about the fact that digital processes drive efficiency, which drives the point of sale to the service, to the delivery of the service, to the generation of an invoice. And if you can improve your daily sales outstanding, your cash flow by X number of days, then that speaks really well to anyone who's holding the purse strings. If you can fund a project through cash flow, they're a lot more likely to unlock that money for you. You know, they'll, they'll give you three million pounds to deliver a project if what you're going to do is give them an extra million pounds in, in daily sales outstanding. You know, that, that's a kind of given because you're self-funding your project at that point. But from that standpoint, I then look at talking about attrition of customer. And I think that's really kind of where Joanna was leading on that, which is actually workforces inside of our customers are moving to younger age groups. Those younger age groups are going to be picking and choosing the vendors they want to work with. And if you are not on a digital platform, they're going to be leaning towards those that are more native to the experience they've had their entire life growing up as a digital individual into their digital working life, right? So I talk about attrition of customer through workforce preferences within your customer. I then talk a little bit about actual efficiency. I bring my sales team into the room, right? I bring them in and have that conversation and go, can you tell them why you want a digital platform? Because I can tell you all the great stuff from a technical standpoint of what it might mean for securing information, for you know driving a, you know everything end to end on that from experience, but you as a salesperson, you're the best person to articulate on my behalf what you want out of that digital platform for our B2B customers. So that, that's sort of my starting point in there. Hopefully that's, that's helpful. See, I think I'd, I'd kind of summarize all those points for me is like there's, there's two areas. There's, there's measurement, you know, measuring the proof of value. How do you prove value through that? Um, and that will be a range of data that's available to you to to determine whether or not what you've deployed is is working. Is it effective? Does it meet the need? Is it producing efficiencies is it bringing in revenue whatever that may be and then the other part is challenge and that's challenge back to procurement and financial colleagues in some degree to the kind of mechanisms already in place if we take erp which you know still now even though many of them are cloud-based we're still having conversations about this being a 10 to 15 year payback for, for large you know kind of multi organizations so like i don't want to operate in a world where i've got a have a payback of 15 years because I'm not going to be here. You know, how do we then start to move away from that and say, well, actually, yeah, we need to move to a different model where we get payback earlier and it's not over that lengthy period of time. And through procurement, it's, you know, making understand that, it, you know, that we, we can't have things in contracts that say things like there'll be no bugs in cloud services or, you know, limited liabilities, all those kind of good things that wrap around that, which sometimes hamper then what you can go and achieve to deliver. So I think there's a, there's a long way to go to help our colleagues and other functions understand that. Mm. And not least of all, the whole CapEx, OpEx debate uh, that exists when we're seeking <laughs> yes. investment mm. for cloud-based services. Yes. So, you know, for, some, for an organization like ours where we have nothing on premise, you know, we've seen over the last four years that that move really that CapEx is there for our laptops and phones and nothing else. Um, so that's that's been a you know a lot of lengthy conversations, but it's 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 the way the world is moving. So we've got to help our colleagues okay. in other functions understand that. Thank you, Carl. And Leon, would you like to wrap us up with your thoughts, final thoughts on this? Area? Yeah, I really want to build on what Amanda and Carl said. I think we spoke about the customer a lot, 
but to be able to push that through and we work on digital strategy with our clients, you really have to connect it to the company KPIs. You have to connect it to um, you know, improvements in the bottom line, improvements in revenue. You have to, um, you know, and throughout the entire process. And I think what is very important is to take what you're doing out to the customer. And for us, we treat, when we say customer, we say that for an, you know, an external customer in the mm. most uh, obvious way, but also for kind of the employees and their experience and internal when, customer. yeah, internal customer, exactly. So take what you're doing out to them and prove that it connects back to the business KPIs because mm. if it doesn't, it's a very difficult conversation. It's mm. very abstract. Mm. So I think that's, uh, that is super, super important. Well, a, a great conversation, another great hot topics debate. Thank you for joining us at the studio.